Welcome to the Best of MBS podcast, a collection of the best interviews hosted by Michael Bungay Stanier, best-selling author of The Coaching Habit and How to Begin. Today's interview is from the We Will Get Through This podcast. Here's your host, MBS. There's a book out there, and it's a book whose title will grab you immediately. And the book is called How to Have a Good Day. And for all of us who are currently in the middle of a pandemic, doesn't that sound good? (laughs) I mean, doesn't that just sound like the book you want to pick up immediately? Because actually, when you look at this book, and it's terrific, in some ways, you could actually call this book, How Best to Survive a Pandemic When Nobody Knows What the Hell is Going On. So... I've come to know the author, Caroline Webb, a little bit, and I'm really excited to have her as a guest. So let me formally introduce you so we know just what a gem we've got here. She is an executive coach, an author, and a speaker who specializes in showing people how to use insights from behavioral science to improve their professional lives. Her book is called How to Have a Good Day, and it's been published in 14 languages and more than 60 countries. She's also a senior advisor to McKinsey, where she was previously a partner. And if you don't know what that means, McKinsey is that consulting agency which just takes really smart people and notoriously kind of invites the bottom 10% to leave every year. So to become a partner (laughs) means you need to be smart and resilient and successful and to know what you're doing. So it is exciting to talk to Carolyn. I mean, I'll tell you, I almost applied for McKinsey and then looked at it and went, a little too scary for me. I'll move on and do something else instead. So, Carolyn, it's nice to have you here with us. Oh, my goodness. What a gorgeous, lovely introduction. (laughs) I I wish I had that every day of my life. That's wonderful. Thank you. (laughs) You know, I know your book covers so much, but one of the things that you're focused on at the moment and it's particularly prevalent in a, in a confusing time like we're in right now is the power and the importance of compassion and you know I nod violently when I hear that and mm. then I go but I'm not even sure what compassion is how, mm. do you, how do you even define what compassion is yeah well it's we I think we're more used to using the word empathy these days than we were which is already right. a step in that direction of, of being able, able to put yourself in the, another person's shoes and imagine that there is another brain another mind that is not yours and that might come to whatever situation you're in with a whole different set of perspectives and, and needs and, and wants um, I think compassion is sort of the next stage where you're actually doing something active with that. You know, you're not just putting yourself in the other person's shoes, but you're doing something to, to, to help them uh, be their best self. And I think compassion is something that we need a lot of at the moment because a lot of us are, are, are struggling with being our best selves. And, you know, there are very good reasons for that. We're in a very challenging time. So if compassion grows from empathy you know you start with empathy and that allows you to access compassion how do you start by becoming more empathetic Mm. well I think I mean you know you you very kindly introduced me and said that I use a lot of behavioral science in my work and I I do like going back to the research because it does help us get our arms around some things that are a little bit squidgy. Um, It helps us sort of understand exactly the sorts of things that that we're talking about now. And so what we know is that the average brain, when it feels uh, surrounded by something that feels even possibly threatening, not definitely threatening, but maybe potentially threatening, and not necessarily physically threatening, but uh, emotionally, uh, existentially threatening, so things that undermine our sense of competence and control, our, our sense of being you know, respected and, and feeling that we have a place to belong. These things are rewarding for, uh, for the brain, for the human brain, but take them away and we perceive a threat. And when the brain is threatened, we launch a defensive uh, response, which uh, we, many of us will know of as fight or flight, or it's fight, flight or freeze. And mm-hmm. when or faint, that happens, is the other one I heard, fight, yeah. flight or faint, yeah, but right. similar things, which exactly. is like exactly. the little amygdala is freaking out and that's kind of our basic responses. That's right. So your amygdala is part of the, the system in your brain that's scanning the environment the whole time to see, oh, is this a reward? Oh, is this a threat? And responding accordingly. And I think what we know ever more clearly is that when people are in defensive mode, they're very, they're much more conscious of perhaps their competence and their control being undermined. 
hmm. then there's less activity in the part of the brain that's responsible for all the clever stuff, you know, all the, <laughs> and, and not right. just the analytical stuff, but also the, you know, the kindness and the gracefulness and the, and the, you know, the ability to be creative and funny and witty and all of that. So there's less activity in that part of the brain. And that means that, you know, at the moment, a lot of us are feeling like uh, we're not quite at our best because genuinely we're not, because we're feeling right. out of our depth, because our competence is undermined, because our sense of control is undermined. We're slightly threatened a lot of the time, and we know what that does to, to our brains. And so, you know, that's the, the root of empathy is, is to, to understand that this is a normal human reaction and mm. that we are experiencing it. And that other people are experiencing it. And that if you encounter bad behavior, there's an excellent chance it's because uh, they own a brain that is currently on the defensive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, in some ways, we are, we are surrounded by uncertainty and threat all the time. And mm. it's one of the great fictions of our brain is to in some ways persuade us that it's actually not, it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we can carry on. But you know, this pandemic has just made that sense of uncertainty more tangible and more palpable. So true. Yeah. Is, is, is there anything we can do to to calm calm our brain down? Yes. Well, you know, just yeah. So how do we do that? Yeah, it's, it's the perfect question um, because. Uh, you know, we, we do sometimes like uncertainty. You know, we, we quite like not knowing what we're going to get for our birthday. Uh, we, right. we quite like a twist in a in a movie or a book. True. Um, but uncertainty, when it's added to something negative, intensifies our response. And so, uh, you know, you're exactly right. It's not just that things are bad. It's that we don't even know how bad they are. You know, it's just, yeah. it's really, really uh, um, uniquely stressful for, for, for all of us right now. And, and you can see that in the way that the brain reacts to uncertainty. So what can you do? Well, actually, pretty interesting. Um, even if you don't have a lot of certainty to grab onto, the sheer fact of focusing on what you do know, what you control, and who you are in a situation, those kinds of certainties will uh, calm your brain and allow you to respond more effectively to the things that you simply cannot control and cannot be known. And right. it, it's like amplifying your certainties in the middle of a crisis uh, will will allow you, well, it's not like, I mean, it does. Amplifying your certainties uh, helps you cope more effectively with the, the things that remain uncertain. Um, so that's something I've been using a lot, I yeah. have to say, in the last month. Well, that's an interesting triumvirate of of things to try and gain more certainty on or to remind yourself of what you already know because in yeah. some ways there's a reminder of, of that. And of even, the three. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, and even, even just the sheer fact of saying, okay, there's not a lot that I know for sure right now, but I do know how I feel right now. Uh, right. Just the sheer fact of labeling your emotions has been shown to to reduce the sense of state, the, the state of threat, the state of alert in your brain. Yeah, you know, we we actually with a previous guest, Robert Bizois Dina, he is an anthropologist, and he talked a little. He got into some depth about the power of labeling emotion, yes, as a way of helping you feel emotion and process emotion, and not be kind of buffeted around by emotion so exactly. much. Exactly, and the you know the I mean, I think therapists have used this technique for years in PTSD counseling, but actually now you know with advances in brain brain scanning, you can actually see that there is less. Uh, of a state of alert after people have labeled an emotion, a negative emotion. And so, you know, that's a good place to start uh, because you may not know much about what's going on, but you do know how you feel right now. The other thing that I thought was interesting was you pointing to effectively remind yourself about what you know about yourself. Mm. And there's got to be that, that in the moment knowledge, which is this is how I'm feeling right now. But there's also um, a sense of self that you, it sounds like you can reconnect with. And yeah. I'm wondering if there's a tactic or strategy you uh, can point to to help me remind me of who I am. Yeah. Well, I, I, I like to think of um, strengths, values, and experience. I like to mm. remind myself uh, and encourage other people to remind themselves of what is it that they're uniquely good at. And I don't mean necessarily, you know, technical skills. I mean, you know, right. perhaps you're great at bringing people together when they have different points of view, or uh, perhaps you are just brilliant at choosing the right song to you know, shift mm -hmm. the mood. You know, it can be 
anything that uh, that you know is is true about you that you something that you bring that that lights lights up a situation it could be values it could be things you care about that that causes that really matter to you and i think also you know most of us have gone through tough times at some point right i mean that's one of yes. the reasons i called the book how to have a good day rather than how to have an awesome day i was just trying to <laughs> recognize the fact that people are working within constraints a lot of the time and yes so if we can go back to a time when we came through adversity or challenge, however big or small, it helps to remind ourselves that actually, yeah, you know what? I have survived. I have come through this. And mm. whatever helped me then, I can probably tap into now as well. Just to kind of continue being nosy about this, I'm wondering how you help people identify their values. Because, you know, in the world of coaching in particular, that gets kind of bandied around quite a lot as a, a word, as it does in organizational life as well. It's like, here are our organizational values. And if I'm honest, most of the time I see people, I see statements of values. They're, they're a bit bland and a bit insipid and a bit contradictory and a bit kind of hopeless. And and I look at them and I go, so there was an exercise done here, and I'm not sure how this is actually really a useful tool for people. Mm. How you, you may have a strategy for this. How do you help people figure out this actually is a core value for who I am and and what I stand for in this world? It's interesting. I was actually just coaching someone on this this afternoon. Um, he was a, a a guy who was feeling frustrated about whether his work was delivering what he hoped that it would deliver. And mm. um, we were working on getting back to what really he cared about. And uh, the exercise that I've given him for homework is the one that I've done myself every couple of years, um, you know, for as long as I can remember, which is to map out all the moments where you feel, oh, this is, this is truly a peak. There's something, yeah. you know, that feeling in your, well, it, come, it comes in different ways for different people, but that feeling in your chest that sort of is a feeling of sort of release of, of some kind of joy breaking through or calm sure. is that moment of feeling, oh, no, this is how things should be. I, I would do this for, for no money <laughs> if, if you're talking At about- At least for a short pressure. period of time, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, um, is that sort of feeling of, of everything being in its place and you being fully mm. expressed as a human being? People respond, by the way, to different words in that stream of consciousness you know right but peak experiences is one that you know pulls all of that together and says look for patterns and notice what seems to be important to you in those moments and that's that's the work to do part of what i like about that is that exercise transcends experience and it transcends skill yeah i think you know as we get older we just accumulate a bunch of stuff we've done. <laughs> like, here's my resume. You know, I can, you know, I know how to operate an Excel spreadsheet. Now, here's the thing: Excel yeah. spreadsheets slowly suck life out of me, drop by drop, like some kind of Hogwarts spell. But when you go to a peak moment, it captures um, an experience of you fully expressing yourself in a way that you're like, "That's me with my volume knob turned up." Yeah, and it it. It, is, it doesn't really matter what you've learned or what degree you have or what level you rose to in the organization. It's, an, it's a more complete expression of who you are. Yeah. And you can extract patterns and you can extract insight from that. Yeah. And I remember the very first time that I really did this in earnest. You know, I'd, I'd uh, built a career as an economist. And uh, <laughs> I remember sitting down and kind of really trying to map this out because I knew something wasn't quite where I wanted it to be in my career. And mm. I just remember thinking, oh, my goodness, this is this. Oh, I, I appear to be interested in leadership and and have it unlock <laughs> the best in people. Oh, my goodness, I need to do some serious rethinking. So right. you know, I'm not saying the answer is always easy. Um, but it's it's in a time of crisis, in a time of pandemic, it's actually a very nice exercise to go through and to say to remind yourself of saying, okay, actually, these are things that exist in the world that I might yet recreate for myself, nice. and I wonder how I might get back to having a little bit more of that in my life. You know, I heard another exercise as a way of of coming at values and using kind of triangulating. Um, different exercises and it was brilliant it was like what is it about you that people find really irritating <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. and there's something fantastic about that like one of the things that drives oh, people nuts about me is my my ability to generate ideas 
I mean, like, I'm like randomly throwing out ideas, and my wife is like, Michael, please, no. <laughs> and, and, you know, what I've learned when I'm working with people is going, okay, I'm moving into random idea generating. None of these mean anything, so don't feel attached or irritated or whatever. So I've learned how to manage expectations around that. Yeah. But it turns out that um, creation is kind of a, a, a central part of a value for me. Yeah. And just noticing how that rubs up against people can just be a helpful mirror sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. And there are a couple of other things that, you know, you're reminding me. Uh, so one thing I like to do is to get people to connect to their unconstrained self. And one way of doing that is actually to get them to go back to themselves as a kid and to mm -hmm. say, okay, well, what games or activities did you like? No constraints. No one's calling you in. You know, you've got time. What are you doing? <laughs> and what yeah. about, what was it you loved about it? And what of that is still true about you now as an adult? And nice. Yeah, so I quite, I quite like that. And um, and another one that I, I sometimes give people is to say, uh, okay, no constraints. You've, you've read everything you're supposed to read. Now you've got a magazine or a newspaper or you've, you can read anything you want. What is it that you would choose to read about? No, without being judged, no one looking over your shoulder. Right, right. So, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Somebody once said that, it's about identifying your behavior with, with, with your shoes off rather than your shoes on. That's right. That's and, right. I remember that there was that personality test, which, uh, yes, uh, which, which asked you to think about shoes off. That's a really nice way of thinking about it, exactly, yeah. is the unconstrained self. Because so much of what we do is obviously trying to meet people's needs and, and you know, we're in systems with our families and with our colleagues mm -hmm. and, you know, to actually get back to who we are. Uh, is not only very satisfying, but it's 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 uh, it takes a little bit of work. It feels a little counterintuitive to say a good way to start with empathy and through empathy, compassion is to get back to who you are and what matters to you, and get a better, more full expression of how you show up in the world. But how does how does that help? How does setting mm -hmm. that foundation of I've got a better I'm I'm out of I'm out of anxiety because I'm I'm reconnected to the certainties of who I am. Yeah. How does that help me then put myself aside and become other focused? Well, I think it reduces the feeling of threat, you know, because if you think about what, right. what we're coding as threats, typically, they're things to do with our sense of self-worth or our sense of social standing. And if we are, if we take a moment to say, hang on, who am I here? What, what do I care about? What am I going to be proud of when I look back on how I handled this? Mm. And then say, okay, this is who I am. And then you're going to be less stressed. Your brain is going to be uh, less in defensive mode. And therefore, you're going to be able to access all of the, um, the, the, the breadth of thinking, the depth of thinking that you can muster when you're at your best. And that allows you to be really fully there for someone who might not be behaving exactly as you would hope just at this moment. But if you can, if you can remind yourself of your kindest, most generous self, uh, and and you know how what it takes for you to get to that place, then you're of course you're going to come into a conversation with someone else and be able to radiate that uh, and to come into the conversation with less stress for yourself and yeah. think more clearly, more intelligently, more gracefully about how to handle the conversation. So what I notice, Caroline, is I can sometimes show up with the kind of best, most gracious version of myself. Mm. And as long as they behave, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but there are just some people in this world that make my gracious, best version of myself exit stage left pretty quickly. Mm. And this kind of grumpy, reactive, triggered version of me shows up. Yeah, Is there... Any insight you can share around once you once you arrive in a place of compassion, how you can stay there just a little bit longer, mm. <laughs> particularly when the person across the table from you, literally or metaphorically, just is one of those irritating people. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I have two tools in, in the heat of the moment that really, well, I guess three. So the first one is remember that you're probably dealing with a brain on the defensive. Remember mm -hmm. that, you know, the fundamental attribution error that, you know, psychologists have gifted yes. us with, that we attribute bad behavior in other people to bad character when it's probably just bad circumstance. So, right. okay. Well, whilst, whilst justifying all of our bad behavior as, well, it's understandable in the circumstance. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. There you go. Um, no, it's so curiosity and appreciation. They're the things that I genuinely in the heat of the moment will say, okay, uh, 
<sighs> take a breath. Um, what, <laughs> well, I think what, that's a, actually that's a different strategy, which is take a breath. Oh well, yes, I, I, I that totally itself, that. that. That's not trivial. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Take a breath to feel your feet on the floor. My, what I call micro mindfulness. I'm sure everybody has their own little techniques, but for me, mm-hmm. feel my feet on the floor is do one deep belly breath uh, to you know contribute to trying to tell my brain that there's no threat here, nothing to see, everything's right. fine. <laughs> right. um, yeah, curiosity and appreciation. I do find, and, and you know, there's there is good evidence behind this. If you if you ask yourself to get into a curious state of mind and say, I wonder what could possibly have put this person's brain on the defensive, you don't <laughs> you don't actually have to come up with a serious answer. You can you can you can hypothesize. You can say, well, maybe maybe the the, the previous person they were dealing with, uh, you know, threw a cup of coffee in their face, um, right. you know, uh, or you know, maybe they were on a Zoom which uh, completely failed, and they're really right. you know, upset because their dogs. I'm I kid you not. On Friday, I was doing a webinar, and someone's dog sat on the internet cable and <laughs> stopped the recording. So you know, all sorts of things can genuinely happen. Happen. It's quite fun to think about a fun explanation. And of course, you know, then that makes it easier to then think about what could genuinely be triggering them. And then appreciation is is like your silver bullet, as long as it's, you know, yeah. vaguely genuine and you can think about something to say that's appreciative, even if it's to say it must be a busy day for you. Right. Uh, anything which allows you to say, I appreciate the effort that you're making. <laughs> you don't have to say the bit in brackets, which is even if you're being really annoying about it. Uh, right. Um, the sheer fact of, of really pushing yourself to say something genuinely appreciative, however small it is, reduces the feeling of threat on both sides. And that allows you to both you know, have a better chance of being able to connect, uh, not in defensive mode. I love that story about the dog. It's like the 2020 version of the dog ate, ate my, my homework. homework. It's like the, the the dog disconnected my internet. I know, and, yeah. I know. <laughs> we were supposed to be doing all these walkthroughs of the site. And, oh, my goodness. Yes. Anyway, so, you know, people genuinely are having some, some challenging things happen that nobody would have guessed a month yeah. ago. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Carolyn, one of the other things that you talk about, and I know you you share as useful in times like this, is the power of conscious attention. Mm. What what is that, and why is that a helpful thing right now? Well, we don't perceive all of reality. We only perceive a small. <laughs> oh, that's so true. <laughs> yeah, right. So you know, um, my brain, your brain. You know, we can only consciously process a small number of bits of information. Some estimates suggest fifty, and then we're surrounded by trillions of pieces of data all mm-hmm. the time. So uh, we like to think we have a completely objective grip on what we see and what we hear, but actually, our brain is unconsciously subconsciously filtering out anything it seems is irrelevant and you know we kind of know that we we kind of know that you know we can walk down a street and then suddenly see a monument or a building that's been there all the time and you just think well okay well that just obviously hasn't just landed here I guess I just didn't (laughs) see it before um (laughs) and and so you know we know we just have hints from time to time that we don't Mm -hmm. see everything but it's pretty vague and so we tend to think that we know everything that's going on but actually we're filtering out anything that seems irrelevant and the brain decides what's irrelevant by saying okay well i'm going to make sure you see anything that resonates with what's already top of mind for you and we'll filter Uh out everything else which is you know great if you're trying to stay on task if you've got a goal and you're trying to make sure you're staying focused on noticing things that are relevant to that but it's pretty bad when it comes to uh the self-perpetuating nature of our moods because Mm. it doesn't Uh, it's really the research on this I find so interesting. It's so subtle. Um, so hungry people will see words relating to food more quickly in a piece of text they're given. Okay, well, that's, right. sort of, you know, yeah, okay, obvious. Um, sad people will rate a hill as steeper and less pleasant to climb. Huh. Uh, people who've been deliberately put in a bad mood will perceive other people as less likable. Right. And so it goes on. And so if we're reading a lot of bad news at the moment, what are we going to see? What are we going to make sure? What is our brain going to make oh. sure we see more of? More bad. It's, stuff. it's amazing. I mean, just having read some research, I think is related to that. How how subtly we can get primed. You know, yeah. just somebody walking down the corridor, some a student being put in through some test, and they made an old person walk down the corridor in the other way, 
actually affected their own sense of energy <laughs> when they when they show up in the room and you're like this is this isn't being reading anything this isn't yeah. even noticed it's just, just passing somebody who is slightly diminished in their own capacity diminishes our own capacity and it's that, extraordinary yeah and that research is very tricky i mean as you may know it's it's an area of um, massive debate and controversy uh, because what what's happened is that some of that is hard to replicate some of those findings are hard to replicate uh, okay. because you know you may see something here's the thing right you may see something uh, in that person coming down the corridor that reminds you of someone who is super energetic and right. so you know i think that you'll sometimes get those results and you sometimes get something else but you the, the common thing that we can work with here is we need to know we need to be conscious of the influences that are around us and know yes. that it's going to affect us and so the the advice here is not to say stop reading the news because we want to be informed but be aware that you want to make sure that you're balancing it out by making sure you're actively looking out for positive things around you. So, you know, forcing yourself, if you notice you're really feeling pretty grumpy to say, okay, next two minutes, let me spot three good things in my environment. Um, and then because those good things will be top of mind, the selective attention mechanism means that you're more likely to see other good things. Nice. And it's a it's the quickest mood hack I know, and it's so useful right now. It really yeah. is. You know, it's been so useful for me in the last month. You know, one of um, one of the other guests, Neil Pezrica, uh, mm. shared a, a two minute strategy, a two minute morning check in strategy, which I've started using, and I, I really like it. It's it's three questions: um, What will I let go of? Um, what am I grateful for? And what will I focus on? And, you know, it's literally a minute or two to just answer those questions and write them down at the start of the day. But those first two, actually all three questions are you making deliberate choices around what's the incoming and what's the outgoing exactly. in terms of where you, where you put your focus. Right, because it's our both, attention is the, it's the currency of our lives, right? I mean, right. our conscious attention is our sense of self and where we choose to put it, we can be more deliberate about that. And most of us are not. We're sort of ro rolling through the day buffeted by what's happening to us. And it, the beautiful thing is that just like with that exercise you've just mentioned, you know, it can just take you, um, I said two minutes, I mean, frankly, just 30 seconds to say, okay, yep. Let me let me think for a moment or look around myself. You know, what is, oh, that leaf on the tree outside. Well, you know, that's kind of nice. Or this piece yeah. of toast is, you know, <laughs> kind of tasty. You know, it doesn't have to be big. Uh, and it's enough to reset your perceptual filters, just, just enough to make a difference. Caroline, there will be people who will want to bring their conscious attention to you and your work because they <laughs> haven't yet fully noticed you enough. So... <laughs> Instead of a leaf or a slice of toast, point them to somewhere on the internet that they can bring their attention so they can get a sense of who you are and what you're doing in the world. Oh, that's 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 a lovely question. So um, howtohaveagoodday.com is a website which is stacked with um, materials and uh, uh, articles and so on. So you might check that out. If you want to learn more about me personally, then you can click on my picture <laughs> in, uh, in, in that website. So howtohaveagoodday.com, that's a good place to start. Carolyn, thank you. You're awesome. This has been a great conversation. Likewise. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed this Best of MBS interview. Want more great content? Head to mbs.works. There you'll find MBS's new podcast, Two Pages. You can learn about his best-selling books, and you can join the newsletter. That's mbs.works.